previous episode of the Oracle Mobile Application Framework Online Training, we investigated how AMX components and their properties can not only hard code their values, but also refer to Java beans through expression language to read and write values dynamically from Java code. As you can appreciate, this latter piece of functionality is very powerful, as in the code in the bean doesn't have to be limited to just reading and writing data from instance variables, we're practically free to write any Java code the math platform supports. But there is a set of tasks that Oracle recognizes for enterprise class mobile applications that we'll be doing again and again. Because a lot of mobile's functionality is retrieving data and then displaying that on the screen again and again, this sort of programming can become very repetitive, result in lots of boilerplate code that really does nothing different but fetch data and iterate through it, and can be very error prone as developers become sloppy in creating the same code with some minor data differences each time. Let's explain this with an example. Imagine we are building for our organization our very own HR application written in Oracle's mobile application framework mobile solution. So the primary screen of our application shows a list that is a collection of employees as seen here. Now I admit this isn't likely to be one of the best selling applications on the Apple iTunes store or the Google Play store, but we've got to start somewhere. Now, in order for this application to work, it needs access to a HR server with the employee data, which is remote to the mobile device. Essentially, this screen wants to make a call to get all the employees. Now, luckily, the HR server already has, say, a SOAP-based web service with an operation get employees. That returns all our employees in an XML payload. Hmm, so given we know we want a screen with a list of employees and the data is available remotely, how would a programmer solve this given what we know about math already? To break the problem down, I guess we first need a Java bean to invoke the remote web service. So maybe a method called getEmployees could assemble the empty request payload, connect to the remote web service, send the payload, receive a result, and then finally return the result payload to whoever called this method. Then I guess we'd need another Java bean to fetch and hold the list of employees. And this would be invoked from the screen when it's drawn or first rendered. And it would have a method that works as the binding between the user interface list, its rows and the web service call. So that method would potentially invoke the remote web service to retrieve all the employees being agnostic of the underlying web service implementation. Then it will get a handle on the actual UI list component. And for every employee returned from the web service, it would create a row in the UI list. So get the current employee ID, write that to the row. Get the current employee name, write that to the row. Get the current employee mail address, write that to the row. And finally step onto the next record and do exactly the same until all the employees are written to the user interface list. Now, this is an obvious simplification. I've been using pseudocode after all, but it also gives you an idea of how we would break the problem down and solve each part. A lot of the work does seem rather tedious, you'll agree. Just fetching data and mapping it to a user interface component such as the list it doesn't seem to be any real coding involved, just the same old, same old repetitive stuff. Nothing to stress you as a programmer. Hmm, let's look at another scenario for a math application. Now, that imagine that in fact, some of those web services, as we said, were SOAP web services returning collection, but we also needed to get data from other web services, which were REST-based web services returning a collection. And indeed, another source of data was a Java bean returning a collection from, say, a SQLite database on the actual mobile device. From a user interface component developer's perspective, it doesn't really matter where the data comes from. Data is data, or data is data. It's usually a collection of elements. What matters is that all of those different data sources have different APIs, some SOAP, some REST, some JDBC, with different functions which makes writing the code not only tedious, but also error prone as all the different APIs are hard to support. Isn't there an easier way? Could we have some sort of intermediate solution which abstracts away from the underlying implementation, providing a consistent API for us to use 
and save us writing lots of repetitive tedious code. To run with this idea, in the previous example our data was derived from a remote HR server via a SOAP web service. Let's this time say the data actually already resides in a SQLite database which is installed on the mobile device. So again, if we wanted to access this data and display it on the screen in the list, how would we go about decomposing the problem and solving it part by part? To break the problem down, I guess first we need a Java bean to access the database. So maybe a method called get employees could assemble the SQL select statement, execute against the database, retrieve the results, and then return the result payload back to whoever called this method. Then I guess we need another Java bean to fetch and hold the list of employees. And this would be invoked from the screen when it's first rendered. And it would have a method that works at the binding between the user interface list, its rows and the database core. So that method would potentially invoke the database to retrieve all the employees, being agnostic of the underlying database implementation. Then it would get a handle on the actual user interface list component and for every employee returned from the database, it would create a new row in the list, get the current employee ID, write that to the row, get the current employee name, write that to the row, get the current employee's email address, write that to the row. And finally, step onto the next record from the database until all the employees are written to the user interface. Um, is anyone getting a case of deja vu here? Indeed, a lot of the work still seems rather tedious, you must admit, just fetching data from some data source and mapping or binding it to a user interface component. There doesn't seem to be any real coding involved, nothing to stress you as a senior developer, just the same old, same old repetitive stuff. And arguably some of the same old, same old code between calling web services or calling a local database or even a Java bean, the data source doesn't seem to matter too much, does it? Problematically, the APIs for the underlying data sources and the methods to retrieve the data may be different, but most of the code is very, very, very similar, you would agree. You know, this job of being a math or a mobile application framework programmer, I guess we thought it was all going to be exciting, breaking into the brave new world of mobility, but it seems we really are going to be writing lots of boring, repetitive code. So much for the exciting world of enterprise mobile programming, huh? Isn't there an easier way? Could we have some sort of intermediate solution which abstracts away from the underlying implementation, providing a consistent API for us to use and save us writing lots of repetitive, tedious code? Well, guess what? Of course, Oracle has a solution for you. Math introduces the concept of a data control, which is essentially a math framework abstraction that sits above different data sources. As we said, the data can be derived from a custom Java Beam, or a SOAP web service, or a REST based web service. In particular, as the Java Beam can call anything behind the scenes, this implies we can access all sorts of different data sources without knowing their underlying implementation from the user interface perspective. Math data controls are created by wizards and declarative editors, especially pre-built tools, specialized tools for the different data sources, be they Java beans, SOAP-based web services, or REST-based web services. Ultimately, the IDE takes care of a lot of the plumbing, the plumbing or plugging in of these disparate data sources into your application. From there, the real magic occurs in math. Once we define our data control, not only does the data control allow us to treat all data sources generically, but the massive productivity booster for user interface developers is that these data controls and their data collections and their operations can be dragged and dropped from the data control palette onto an AMX page to automatically wire up an AMX, uh, automatically wire up the AMX components to show and call the data control collections and functions with very little programming required by you, the developer. This productivity boost saves you, the developer, having to write huge amounts of tedious code that generally does the same thing again and again. Now the thing about the abstract data control is that it tends to be a bit abstract to talk about. So let's run through a demo of building an application and we'll see how the data control is created 
and how the pages bind to the data control with very little work on your, the developer's behalf. In the previous example, we talked about integrating remote web services or a local database data source. In the following demo, rather than wiring our components directly to a managed bean, instead we'll create a Java bean, publish it as a data control, then create a page from the data control just to show you that we can use the same data control technique for Java beans too. In our demo, let's start with a very simple example where we want to expose a list of employees to our user interface. To do this, we start with a simple employee POJO containing member variables such as employee ID, first name, last name, and email, as well as the relevant constructor and getter and setter methods. We also have a class called HR Service, who will instantiate a bunch of hard-coded employees based on the POJO we just saw into a list of employees, as well as provide a method getEmployees to return the list. Now, in a real application, the employees wouldn't be hard-coded like this. You might retrieve them from a local SQLite table on the mobile device or remotely from a web service. But for the purposes of the demonstration, it doesn't matter where they come from, it's how we set up the data control that is important. As you can see here in the JDeveloper IDE, we can see both classes defined. As the user interface wants to display the list of employees, we need to publish the HR service class as a data control. We do this by right-clicking the HR service class and selecting the Create Data Control option from the context menu. This invokes the Create Bean Data Control dialog, where we can define the name of the data control and set other options beyond the scope of this training here, and ultimately create the data control in our application. Once the data control is defined, in the parent datacontrols.dcx file, beyond two implicit data controls, application features, and device features that already exist, you can also see the HR service data control we just created. Having defined our data control, you'll note within the application navigator window, there is a panel called data controls. If we open that, we can see the list of the data controls that are defined in the data control.dscx file. If we expand the HR service data control, we see a node called employees which represents a call to our getEmployees method in the HR service class that returns the employees collection. In addition, if we select the employees node, we can see the attributes of the underlying employee class that we saw earlier. That is employee ID, first name, last name, and the email address. Having seen how to create a data control and how it all hangs together behind the scenes, now let's look at how we can make use of this in building our AMX user interface page. So here we have a pre-canned AMX page called employees.amx. What we can do with the HR service employees object in the data control palette is literally drag and drop it into the page. In doing so, JDeveloper gives us a number of options on how we want to represent the employees list, essentially a collection of data on the page. There are all sorts of different options, including lists, gauges, maps, and so on, which is up to you to pick the most relevant to the data that you are dropping onto the page. With employees, an option is we may want to display one at a time in an editable form. So here we can select the form, then math form option. On doing so, we are presented with the dialog that gives us options about which attribute of an employee do we want to display on the screen? What components do we want to use? and do we want to override their labels and potentially reorder them on the screen too. For now, we'll leave the defaults. Having done this, you'll note that the AMX pages code has been updated with a number of controls. If we expand the source code, we can see that a number of input text controls have been added in a panel form layout component. You remember from an earlier episode, panel controls are responsible for laying out their children tags in a standard way. The panel form layout control at runtime lays out its child tags such that the child components labels are on the left and the fields are on the right arranged vertically down the screen. Moving on, we can see our first input text control where we note the value property is mapped to the EL expression hash squiggly brackets bindings.employee.inputValue close squiggly brackets. Now it's not exactly clear what this syntax means. 
The obvious part is Jade Developer has mapped the input text control against some sort of binding calling a method called input value. Hmm, so there's definitely some sort of mapping going on here to a binding, but where is it defined? How has Jade Developer done this? You'll note an additional tab at the bottom of the AMX page called Bindings. If we select that, we can see that this page, when we drag in the employees object from the data control palette, has configured a binding for us for all four attributes, employee ID, first name, last name, and the email address. These in turn map to an iterator. Hmm, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because when we're displaying one employee at a time from the employees list, we need an iterator to display the current row. And then finally, ultimately, that maps back to the HR service data control, the employees node, which if you remember, is the get employees method within the HR service class. Note that these bindings are actually stored in their own XML file, typically the same name as the page plus the suffix pagedef.xml. So here you can see in the application navigator, the employees pagedef XML file, which when if we click on it, displays the same bindings editor that we saw from the AMX page. As you can see, in combination, the data control and the bindings are what automatically call the data source, provide the data to the user interface layer. While developers are free to code all of this themselves, the fact that the IDE welds this all together on the developer's behalf makes this whole exercise a breeze. Given that this is many viewers' first introduction to the powerful math binding layer, let's go over this again to describe what happens at runtime. When a user interface page is rendered and an AMX component refers to an EL expression like hash squiggly brackets bindings.employeeid.inputValue, the math engine at runtime will evaluate the EL expression. First, it needs to evaluate what the object bindings refers to. Now, bindings, the word bindings, has special meaning to the EL expression engine. It knows that this implies that there is a page definition file for the current AMX page that defines all the bindings that map back to the data control behind the scenes. Problem is, it doesn't know which page definition file to use. It works this out by looking in the data bindings.cpx file of the view controller project. Essentially, this maps pages to the page definition file. Once the EL engine knows the page definition file to work with, it then moves on to assessing that what bindings it's looking for. As we can see here, employee ID is the one we're looking for. In the page definition file, that binding, an attribute value, then maps to an iterator for walking all the employee records and returning the current employee and the associated employee ID, which itself maps back to the data control we created earlier. So in this episode, we've looked at how we make use of the very powerful data control features in MAF framework. That is wiring up Java beans, SOAP based web services, REST based web services into our user interfaces page. But we use these data controls to avoid a whole bunch of tedious work of basically fetching and displaying data. The real productivity booster is these data controls save you doing all that work and you can even wire up pages and components just using the data control palette without having to create your, create your pages one field at a time. Thanks very much for your time today. Hope we'll catch you in the next episode very soon. Thank <laughs> you.